So I'm here today to talk to you about language, but it just so happens that our Commander-in-Chief is the uh, most famous example of what I'm going to talk about today, and it centers around his famous moniker, the Donald. So the story goes that his uh, former wife, Ivana, who was Czech, once referred to him as the Donald in public, and it stuck. And the reason that she did this is because in Czech, it's pretty common to use the equivalent of the word the with people's names. So words like the, but also that and my, form a group of words called determiners. And determiners are everywhere. They're found across languages, and they sort of help sentences stick together. So typically, words like the, that, and my go with things called common nouns, things with defining properties like cat or tree or suitcase. So in English, with the, that, and my, we can say things like the suitcase is upstairs. And that means not just an abstract idea of a suitcase, but a particular one that I expect you to be familiar with. And I can say, that suitcase is upstairs, and it means a particular one at a certain distance. And I can say, my suitcase is upstairs, and that means a particular one that I possess. So those are all good sentences, but in English, I could not say something just like, suitcase is upstairs. We need a determiner for the sentence to work. Now, when we talk about people and we use their names, we're inherently talking about particular people. And so in English, I can say things like, Paul is upstairs. And that's a good sentence. And I don't need a determiner there to make the sentence work. However, across languages and including in English, we can and do find determiners with people's names. So we can say things like, the Paul McCartney is upstairs. Or the Ohio State University, <laughs> right? Um, or we can say things like, my Paul got into Harvard Law. Or that Paul got into Harvard Law. And those all work. But a native speaker of English understands that saying, my Paul, means more than just the Paul that I possess, and saying, that Paul, means more than the one over there. So now we need to wonder, what exactly does the word say that do when it gets added to a person's name if it doesn't need to be there for the sentence to work? So in order to understand the full range of meanings of that plus a name in English, we really need to examine some, some different situations to get a good idea. So imagine a situation where Jake sends his mom flowers for Mother's Day to her workplace, and she opens the card and says out loud, that Jake. And so someone who overhears her is going to understand something like, Jake is a sweetheart, he's so thoughtful. Now imagine a different Jake, and this time Jake is a high school football player who gets injured but insists on finishing out the game. And so one fan turns to another and says, that Jake. And now someone's going to understand that Jake is really tough and dedicated. He's a hero. And finally, let's imagine a case where Jake is uh, a student who's constantly getting into fights. And he lands in the principal's office, and one receptionist says to the other, that Jake. And this time, we understand something like, Jake is a mess and really needs to get his act together. So we see that with the same little structure, if we stick it into different contexts, we get a different interpretation for each. So now we need to wonder, what exactly is the word that doing there with the person's name? What kind of meaning is it adding if every time we get a different meaning? Well, it turns out this is a really interesting question to ask, and it tells us a lot about human communication. So I wanted to get into this, but I needed a case where this happens really often to get lots of examples and lots of data. But in English, even though we're all pretty familiar with this and may use it once in a while, it's not very common. However, the parallel construction is very common in Spanish. So I decided that in order to answer my question about determiners with names, I needed to ask it in Spanish. <laughs> so what I did is I took cases with the parallel construction. So instead of that plus name in Spanish, the equivalent is the plus a name. So we have things like el Pedro está aquí, that's something like that Pedro is here, and la Susie está aquí, that's something like that Susie is here. And so I gave people, I pulled about 100 Spanish speakers from all over the world to do an online survey that I created. And I took sentences like these and gave them imaginary scenarios, like imagine that Pedro is your ex-boyfriend, or imagine that Susie is your best friend. And I asked the speakers that were taking my survey to rate these sentences in cases with the determiner like this one on how strongly they thought the person talking felt about, say, Pedro in this particular situation. And then in parallel situations, I asked them to rate the speaker's intensity of feelings when the determiner was not there. And what I found is actually a really interesting result. 
So on a scale of from negative one to positive one, where negative one is that the person talking is totally neutral, and positive one is that they feel very strongly, very intensely emotional toward the person, we see this massive gap between when the determiner is not there, leaning heavily toward feeling neutral, and when the determiner is there, getting this massive boost in intensity. And in the next graph, each of these colored lines represents a different group of speakers based on how often they said that they use this structure. And what's really cool here is that regardless of how often you say that you do this, you're sensitive to it in the exact same direction. So controlling for everything else in this kind of an experiment, not only do we get a sense of exactly what the word the, in this case, means with a name, but we're also effectively quantifying feelings. So, these are just some of the languages that have strategies for conveying attitudes with names, with things like determiners or other little tiny pieces of linguistic material. So our next question needs to be, why so many languages, first of all, and also from such vastly different language families, everything from Japanese to Portuguese to Czech? Well, it turns out that the word that is actually, a, or the determiner in the equivalent languages, is actually a really great strategy for conveying nuanced attitudes. So if we go back to the, to the situation with Jake and the secretary, we can remember what she said and wonder, what exactly did she say? Can anyone quote her? Could she get in trouble for speaking ill of a student? So the word that takes about a quarter of a second to say, and other languages use pieces of linguistic material that are even smaller, and yet something that is so tiny that on its own really means very little is doing tremendous amounts of communicative work because it tells the listener to sift through loads of contextual information, pick out relevant pieces, and bridge them together to get a reading of an attitude that the speaker didn't even really say. So we do it despite which particular language we speak, and we get examples from all over the world. So when Kylie Jenner announced, this is Kim Kardashian's sister, announced that her baby was going to be named Stormy, the world exploded with its opinions about the child's name. So we got tweets from everywhere, and Twitter got really fun really quickly. So a speaker of Spanish in El Salvador said the equivalent of, if that Kylie can name her kid Stormy, then I can name mine Sailor Moon. <laughs> and a Dutch speaker that said, the name that that Kylie and Travis gave their baby is a name fit for a dog. And then, I know, and then a speaker in Japan who was actually a very supportive fan said the equivalent of, you know, the name that, that I thought that that Kylie did a great job hiding her pregnancy. But then a less than impressed Italian speaker said, frankly, I don't care about that Kylie. And finally, a French speaker, very wise, said, so that Kylie named her kid Stormy? Madam, it's a child, not a lip kit. <laughs> yeah. So there's something about human communication that pushes us to find a strategy for conveying our attitudes about people in ways that are indirect. And what's amazing is that people's minds work in incredibly similar ways in spite of operating in distinct individual languages. And time and time again, data like the ones I've shown you today show us a linguistically level playing field, whereby regardless of our social position or our geographical location, we're all equally good at playing this language game of calculating meanings via context. So ultimately, we all manage to say so little because context says so much. So, the Kylie Jenner example is maybe humorous at best, but this can actually give us a reading of the global temperature around the world for things that really do matter. So uh, a German speaker tweeted, that Trump isn't doing so poorly. Tax reform brings the US money right now. And on the other end of the spectrum, an Italian speaker said, that Trump is crazier than a constipated mountain goat, signed Mona Lisa. <laughs> and the GIF was in the original. I kept it. So it's you, it's me, it's people all over the world, and we're all effectively using things like determiners to do this sort of thing. And it's even my mom who, when I shared my, my post that I was going to be a speaker at this event, shared it with the caption, so proud of my Eleni. She actually used the structure that I was going to be talking about without even realizing it. <laughs> and she is here today. So we tend to appreciate language as an art, and we're, we're, we're used to that. But I think that if we could learn to appreciate language as a social and cognitive system, whereby little blips of, of conversation, like determiners, light up the mind and activate its retrieval system, and do this tremendous amount of cognitive work, I think that we could better appreciate ourselves and our place in the natural, scientifically observable world as a whole. Thank you.